Hey, let's talk about uh, a couple things, elections and then the uh, Black Lives Matter movement. So you'll see this is a sign for Dave Cortese. He's running for a state office. He either is or was a county board of supervisors member, basically the equivalent of a city council, but for the county. Uh, he ran for mayor against somebody called Sam Licardo, and they both went to the same high school. So what's really happening here with the political system in California from top to bottom is essentially <laughs> kind of a, an inheritance. You know, you're inheriting a position. Somebody moves out and then the union lawyers or, you know, whoever it is, that's whatever organization it is that, can, that has the majority of the votes, you know, basically it creates a situation where they maintain power by moving people around when term limits set in. So in other words, they keep the same team in place, meaning that when you vote for somebody who's a politician in much of California, which is a one party state, a de facto one party state where one party controls every office, um, you know, legislature, governor and so on. When you do that, what you're really doing is you're voting for a team to stay in place in, at this point perpetually. And you can see that in, you know, there's no, there's no um, question that Cortez is going to win. You don't even have to, honestly, you don't even have to have the election because he wouldn't be put in that position by the team unless they knew that he was going to win. And you can see the potential for mischief. You know, it's just simply moving people around, especially in terms of county elections or in smaller towns where it's not that hard to move people around and, you know, create a situation where you either open up a, either a nonprofit like a church or a, you know, these mega churches start to make more sense when, when we finish talking. You've got that situation and then you've got a situation where, you know, just even if it's a corporation, uh, they can hire X, Y, and Z and then essentially, essentially move people around. Uh, and, and that matters when, say, in a place like Florida that has a national election, the differences we're talking that make these elections in Florida and Ohio are going to be a matter of a few thousand votes. So the first thing you want to understand before we talk about the Black Lives Matter movement is that we don't have a democratic system in the, in the, in the US. You have a system of consolidation of power that claims to be a democratic system in order to essentially, we're not gonna use the word cover up, but essentially to create a situation where power is maintained in order to maintain other things like property values and so on. I've said this a thousand times, you know, these houses out here, you know, there's no way they should be worth a million dollars, but they are. The same house here, you know, <laughs> it would be about $100,000 in Texas or in Michigan, in Nebraska, certainly in Omaha, which is a nice place to raise kids. And like I said, I mean, this house is a bit bigger, but still you're looking at $250,000 in Texas, in a big town in Texas. So it's Halloween, by the way. This person has done a really good job with the decorations. And you can see that in many cases they've inherited property because you don't necessarily see an upgrade in, you know, say cars or other things. And so you, you see that at some point, what, what's really happening here is an inheritance situation, politically and economically. Now, what does that have to do with Black Lives Matter? It has everything to do with Black Lives Matter because this may be the first political movement in American history unlike Occupy Wall Street, that has a chance to succeed. And the reason it has a chance is because it's not trying to undo the fact that the economic system in this country is essentially one that's driven by banks and Wall Street in an alliance with government. So people in this country like to think of government and corporations as separate. That's not the case anymore when you have, say, police unions and teachers unions, all of them passing laws that guarantee themselves seven to eight percent guaranteed returns on pension funds. And the only way you're going to get those seven to eight percent guaranteed returns on the pension funds is going to be with an alliance with Wall Street. So when you, when you go against Wall Street in isolation and you blame them for the, for the problems of the economy, and the banking system, 
it's not going to work because you're not you're coming at it from an angle that doesn't understand what the economic system is really based on which is an alliance between the government and the banking sector with the banking sector being one of america's primary reasons for success which is undisputed if you go to a smaller country even a country that's an ally of the u.s say the dominican republic based on security issues as well as other issues um, primarily in terms of access in the U.S. dollar, which is the de facto currency of the world right now, today, you know, you can only get maybe a couple, a couple maybe a hundred dollars out of a Dominican bank's ATM. So there's an access issue. And you start to realize that, you know, even if you go to a place like Cuba, which is not an, obviously not an ally of the United States, and in Cuba, they don't, even, they don't even, they accept U.S. dollars, but they charge you a 10% fee they make it really difficult to use it and of course they instead prefer you know canadian dollar and other and probably the you know at this point the, the chinese one maybe um simply because that's who they do trade with uh perhaps the ruble and so on and you start to when you analyze black lives matter and of course the Domin dominican republic and cuba are primarily uh, African-American, or oh, sorry, <laughs> or African countries of where the people are primarily of either Spanish or African descent. Now, this matters because with Black Lives Matter, BLM, the reason it can succeed is because it's not asking to overturn the economic system in a way that doesn't make any sense, or in a way that threatens the United States' ability to maintain its leadership position in an area like banking, which is vital to the values that we're looking at here, that quite frankly are probably inflated, like the house over here that's a million dollars. What BLM is really doing is, is it's saying that this house might be a million dollars, but which, the reason it's a million dollars is because of political consolidation, which harkens back to another time of, you know, where are the Spanish from Europe, white Spaniards came in from the Catholic Church and bought up a lot of land and settled this area. Essentially, when I use the word settled, I mean steal from people who were here, the Native Americans, or as the Canadians call them, First Nations people. So there's a reason again why the word for black in America is actually Spanish, right? Negro. That goes all the way back to New Orleans being a you know, a, a slave trading center, which was the reason for its success. Now, if you go into New Orleans today, you'll notice it's got a French Quarter, a very nice place, one of the nicest places in the U.S. to visit. And of course, that's because the French had a revolution, they beat the Spanish, and then they essentially took over the Spaniards' land in the U.S. And so that's where you get the French. And it was an anti-Catholic revolution in France, because like every other empire, the Spaniards overextended themselves, but not before they essentially you know, bought, settled, or stole a lot, of the land, a lot of the land here, and in the process of doing so, you know, gave cities here Spanish names. And of course, you see that the, you know, San Francisco, Santa Clara, all these things are European names. Now, Cortesi is an Italian name that, of course, goes back to the, the alliance between Italy and Spain, and the Roman Empire that has continued or tried its best to continue its, its, its power and its real estate holdings over time. So it's not a coincidence, again. These things are tied together. Licardo is an Italian name, again, Catholic. So it's not a coincidence that you settle, you buy the land, and then you, you're able to use those, that kind of power to influence the police departments and then shift gov government revenue to the police departments, which these days gives you, ac gives you access to surveillance and information, which is the most valuable commodity of, of all. Because that allows you to do things like make, make more investments uh, that you can then, you know, take the rent by, and then invest it in, say, an IPO that you have access to, and so on and so forth. And you can see that on paper this sounds great, but not if you're excluding people from the system. And that's precisely the complaint of BLM, is that, you know, the... The fact that you have this consolidation in such an open way is a result of de jure segregation, segregation by law. And when that failed around the 1960s, 
what ended up happening was the people that controlled the property decided that uh, they didn't want an integration, so they used other mechanisms on a local level, you know, despite the National Civil Rights Act, in order to maintain essentially segregation policies that in their minds would maintain property values. And that's not an argument that is illegitimate. If you look at New Orleans, for example, outside the French Quarter, is essentially a ghetto. And that's not shouldn't be surprising once you understand American history. If you have a slave port that then loses a war, that's, that then creates issues in terms of using that revenue from the foundation of your economy, of course it's going to be a ghetto. If you have a Detroit, where you have essentially an economy that's based on a specific combustion engine and specific cars, and then suddenly the Japanese start making much better cars, and you stay put, you don't innovate, suddenly Detroit becomes a ghetto. Even, even if a nearby city like Dearborn is fine, because it's not tied into that consolidation of economic power. So the fact that you see these million dollar homes, there isn't, isn't anything, there's not anything written in stone that would say that this place won't become a ghetto in 75 years. Um, so there's a limit to how much segregation you can have. There's a limit to how much money you can print. There's a limit to how many IPOs you can, you can sort of, you know, go public with in order to create that cash flow that maintains the values of these homes and everything else. Now, you have to remember, as Warren Buffett said that, I'm paraphrasing, you know, the asset values are always, they always fluctuate. It's the debts that remain constant. And that's not always true, right? If you inflate your currency, the debt sort of, you know, in real terms goes down. Um, so there's a lot of other issues involved, right? But from a straightforward perspective, cash basis accounting, that's absolutely true. The debts are always secure. It's the asset values you have to worry about. And you can see why. Because if you have a movement like BLM that says, well, these asset values may be legitimate based on the economic system, but they're really also based on segregation. And that means that the inequality that we, the inequality that we see here today in this country, the whole, the whole country, is illegitimate. And it's not based on merit. It's not a meritocracy. And if it's not a meritocracy, then what is the feature that's going to unite the country. It's certainly not going to be a shared vision of history. Because remember, what you're really saying is that the people who live in this community don't really deserve 100% to live in a house that's worth a million dollars when in a more diverse community in Texas, it's worth you know a quarter of that. What you're really saying is, on top of that, that this, is, this wealth has been garnered based on slavery and segregation and theft, which is a radical idea because it means to people in these homes, even if they themselves are immigrants and bought the houses legitimately without any connection to all these other policies which we just talked about, they're still sort of in a, an illegal quandary where you have sort of stolen goods, you know, in a sense. And so the other issue is that this country is only a couple hundred years old, so you can't actually say that if you're a native-born white American, as opposed to a native-born black American, you can't actually say that, well, you know, this idea of a meritocracy is not really true, especially if you have the opportunity to inherit money. And especially if the entire tax code is designed to create a system that where you have housing price appreciation. And that's undisputed. The tax code is designed to make sure houses go up in value in most of the country. No one disputes that. There's a mortgage interest tax deduction. There's leverage that you can't get anywhere else. And so no one disputes that these houses are the product of a tax policy that is, that is, that is then tied into a history of segregation and slavery which then means that everything the United, the United States talks about in terms of a meritocracy is, is now, it comes under not only this questioning, but the very idea of inequality being acceptable 
is in fact the idea that people, especially immigrants, have worked and have contributed something to society besides just inheriting property under a tax policy that rewards them for and their ancestors for segregation, whether directly or simply standing by and benefiting from that situation. So you can, and the United States has done a pretty good propaganda job, right? It said, you know, immigrants have come here and been successful. A lot of the trillion dollar companies that you see today are founded by the children of immigrants. The CEO of Google was born in India. But you have to remember that if that's your history under the BLM view, you sort of have to have immigrants coming in. They're necessary because remember the people that have inherited these homes, especially if you have, say, two kids, only one of them can you know, get the home. So it's primarily it has to be sold. Well, who are you gonna sell it to? If you have a, such a, a heavy concentration of power that really requires, really means that you can't just sell it to people that are already native born. You have to sell it to new people. Well, we're, we're gonna get those new people in an environment where birth rates have, have gone down. And the answer, of course, is immigration. So it's not, we tend to think of immigration in, in America as something that's, that we do for the benefit of other people. In reality, immigration is something that the housing market has done for its own benefit as well as the, as the entire GDP of the country, because once you realize that the banks borrow money or lend money based in part on the assumption of valuation of these homes, whether or not they're inflated, whether or not the asset values are false, you start to see that the entire economy is actually based on immorality. And therefore, you can't justify this idea of massive inequality anymore once you change the narrative. We know that everything I just said is true because otherwise we wouldn't have had the housing crisis of 2008 and 2009. We wouldn't have needed a trillion dollar bailout, multi-trillion dollar bailout, then, today, in the past. And so we know that there's a problem here with the foundational elements, not only of the economy, but of the story of the narrative that's being used to drive these issues, this inequality, that happens to have major overlaps with race. Once we realize it's not a randomized situation, it's a deliberate policy, not just taxation, but also racial segregation. And you start to, at that point, question everything. And that's why BLM has a chance because it's based on something that is actually tied to reality, it's tied to not just inequality, you know, just not just unequal economics within the country, but worldwide. And you start to realize that once you once you understand that well, the currency is based on the, on the stability of the banking sector, which is of course tied to the security of the banking sector, which is of course tied to the uh, the idea that these values are correct, that these asset values that are being used to lend money are correct. Because if they're not correct, that means that you have to discount future cash flow and suddenly you, your currency is no longer as, as strong. Which means that your whole, your ability to, to argue that your currency as opposed to somebody else's currency should be the dominant, dominant currency of the world. That starts to be under, that starts to crack. If you're in London, you already know this, right? You already know that within a small portion of, of the city, a lot of the values of property values are only as high as they are because of, of you know foreigners perhaps from Russia coming in and buying up property in order to launder money. And so they've made money in Russia, they have to get the money out of the country because the ruble is not stable. Yeah. And so they're trying to move the money out. Same thing if you're in India, right? If you're in India, you know, the rupee is not stable. You can't really take it out of the country. Uh, it's not something that floats. And so you're in a position where you have to get that, if you've made any sort of money, you've got to get that money into a stable banking sector. So we see right away why Occupy Wall Street failed. It's trying to undo essentially the, all of the units of success that go into the, econo the economics, not necessarily the inequality, right? The inequality is a feature but it's a feature that's tied into sociology. 
which of course includes things like segregation. So we see, we should be able to see right now why there's at least some sort of hope. And, but of course this means that if you have, if you're white, you have blue eyes and blue eyes are a recessive trait, which means that they can't really exist in large numbers within any area without segregation, whether informal or formal. You have to start to realize that what you're really talking about here is not a successful country, but a country that has been founded on immorality and then has spent centuries trying to cover that up. And I use the word cover up, and it's, it sounds very conspiratorial, but you can see the danger in a situation where people start to realize that anyone would, you know, who has white skin and blue eyes doesn't necessarily deserve to live in a one million dollar home as opposed to a hundred thousand dollar home. You start to see why the French Revolution happens. When you go back and forth, you start to now see why there are a lot of people, especially white people today, younger people, that are also the victims of this consolidation of power because when you have consolidation of power to such an extent, it doesn't just harm people that have been left behind, it harms future generations. And I've made this analogy before and I like it, so I'll say it again. When you're borrowing money from future generations, what you're really doing is you're creating a sort of a secondary and tertiary claim on bonds. And as we all know, you know, the people that come in that are second and third in line have a weaker claim to assets and the future flow of income than the first bondholders. Everyone accepts that in economics. That's just something everyone knows. You know, you don't come in as, unless of course, I suppose, unless, no, even, even if your company is about to go bankrupt, it's, it's very un unlikely that you're going to be in a position where, you know, the first bondholders that have a claim are going to be able to say, well, screw it, we'll let the, the new money come in and, and trump our claim to the first lien on the assets. And that of course is, you know, why, right? It's the same concept, right? If you're first in line, it means that you have an advantage uh, you know, your capital has already been deployed. It's had a chance to inflate, to appreciate. And the people coming in have not, have not had that opportunity. They're trying to negotiate something that allows them to get in on this limited supply. And that's still true to an extent, but you can see how the analogy applies in a, in a similar way to things like economic inequality. So hopefully that gives you some background about what, why BLM has a chance because it's kind of, what you're talking about is a spiritual movement that's designed to remove the fake news debacle in the US, which is itself a natural consequence and a feature of having history taught in a way that is, that tries to cover up the country's immorality. And once you accept that foundation of immorality, fake news has to be a natural consequence. It becomes a feature, not a bug.